This podcast is a presentation of Indianola First Assembly of God Church. For more information, please visit us online at indianolafirst.com. Thank you, Pastor Barry. And uh, Pastor Jared prayed over the anointing on his message, but he's not preaching today, so I'm going to go ahead and steal that anointing. So Lord, please take that anointing that he prayed over Pastor Barry and put it on this message. I got you, Jared. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot you're preaching. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm excited to preach today. And um, I want to uh, just mention from like a few weeks ago, uh, the, the basketball world lost a great player in uh, Kobe Bryant. I think most of us know um, that that happened. And, that, and there was... Um, multiple people in that uh, helicopter uh, crash. But today I, I want to talk about, uh, just for a brief minute, about Kobe and the Mamba mentality. Uh, Kobe was one of the best basketball players to ever play the game. Uh, he did some amazing things on the court that caused you know, people's jaw to just drop. Um, now, I personally, uh, this is just a personal opinion, so please don't be mad at me. I, 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 don't, I can't say that Kobe was the greatest player ever to live because I grew up with watching Michael Jordan play. So to me, Michael Jordan is the best to ever play. Kobe is great. And I'll tell you this, I'll jump on the other thing and say that Kobe is way better than LeBron James. <laughs> LeBron is no, no good. So I mean, like, I think we can agree on... Well, some of us can agree on that. I don't know. But, uh, but Kobe is definitely up there for sure. He is up there. There was a lot, of gr- a lot of things that made Kobe great while he was on the court. But there was something that would come over uh, Kobe when he was playing that would, that would elevate him and make him better than everybody else that he stepped onto the, the court with. And what Kobe called this, and he ended up calling this the Mamba mentality, and that was his logo for the Mamba mentality. And I'm not sure if anybody else did this after Kobe passed away, but I caught myself talking about the Mamba mentality a lot after he passed away. I mean, like, and I would just, I would be walking around my house and just putting into everything, like telling my kids, come on, you got to get up and face this day and have the Mamba mentality when you go to school. You got to, Maddie plays basketball now, so right before we would go out there, I'd be like, all right, Maddie, you got to have that Mamba mentality. Get out there and, and have that Mamba mentality. I'd just put it into whatever. Come on, wake up, take a, take a bath with Mamba mentality, you know, whatever. I could just, however I could fit it in. And <laughs> honestly, I didn't even know what it was, so I was like, I better look this up. <laughs> I better check out what this Mamba Mamba mentality thing really is, because I'm just saying it all the time right now, and I need to find out what it is. All right, and after I said, uh, so, I, so, so I looked it up, and I found out that it, it, Kobe named himself that, uh, the Mamba mentality, and he named it after the Black Mamba, the Black Mamba snake. <clears throat> and this snake is among, among, among one of the world's deadliest snakes. It is the fastest land snake in the world and the longest species of venomous snake in Africa. They are, ex- ex- uh, they are extremely toxic and very fast. They are aggressive when threatened and known to strike repeatedly and inject large volumes of venom with each strike. Uh, the black mamba is a, is a fierce and very dangerous animal. <clears throat> so if you look at Kobe and his stats, you see that this is exactly how he played the game of basketball and how he lived his life. It went beyond just basketball. It's how he chose to live his life. In fact, Kobe said this about the Mamba mentality. He said, it's a way of life. I do think that it's important in all endeavors to have this mentality. He played with that, that fierceness and he lived his life with that fierceness, the Mamba mentality, the fierceness that says, I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be the strongest. I'm going to be the smartest. I'm going to be the, the, the greatest at anything um, on the court and off the court. I read some of his stuff, and it said that he worked harder than anybody. In fact, I read that he would get up early, and he would go and work out for t- like two hours before his kids would wake up. Then after the, uh, after the day went by and he did all his stuff, put the kids back to bed, he would go and work out uh, even more. He wanted to give everything he could for the game of basketball and not forfeit his family time or forfeit anything else in that. <clears throat> and we can tell by reading some of his stats that he really lived this Mamba mentality. I just want to give you a couple of his stats. He had 33,643 career regular season points. 
That's a lot, okay? If you don't know, that's, that's a lot. Um, uh, he had a single game where he scored 81 points by himself, all right? The team didn't score anymore. He scored 81 um, by himself. His final game, he scored 60 points. He was 37 years old at that time. Uh, I'm 37 right now, and I catch myself holding on to the railing really tight when I wake up in the morning to walk down the stairs. <laughs> Might be because I have a, mad ba- a bad mattress. It might just be because um, I feel older now. I don't know. But he, at 37, he competed on a high level and scored 60 points. He entered the league and made his first start when he was 18 years old. He, had five, he got five championships, two numbers retired, two finals MVP awards, two scoring titles, and two Olympic gold medals. He really competed with this Mamba mentality. And as I I read through some of Kobe's book called The Mamba Mentality, it showed me that he really did live with this mentality. There were so many stories of different players. Like every time I turned the page, it was of a different player. And he knew everything about that player. And he knew how to defend that player, how to shoot against that player. Whatever he needed to do to better himself, he knew about that player to make him better than the other person. Um... He was a student of the game. Like, he, he tore his index finger, the ligaments in his index finger. This is something I didn't know. But he tore the in, um, ligaments in his index finger. And while he shoot, uh, he would shoot with the ball rolling off of that finger. I mean, he just had all these little details about his game that he would do. Uh, well, after he tore those ligaments, he had to uh, learn how to shoot again, learn a different way of shooting to where the ball would roll off his middle finger instead of his uh, index finger. I mean, this was all a part of his mentality. And this Mamba mentality, this mentality set him apart from everybody else who he was playing for. One time Kobe said, you have to give everything to the game, to, to your team. That's what it takes to win. That's what it takes to be great. Now, Kobe said this after his sixth straight game of scoring 40 or more points. He, see, he said this with his knee swelled up to the size of a grapefruit. He said this with his body not wanting to really move anymore. With all that stuff happening in his body, he said you have to be great and you have to be willing to give your everything to this game and to your team. All right, so with all that in mind, um, I really, honestly, uh, today, I don't, I don't want to just talk about the Mamba mentality. I'm not here to just talk about Kobe and all of his great accomplishments, even though he had a lot and he was a great basketball player. But I'm here today to talk to you and pose a question of what if? What if? What if instead of us living our lives with the Mamba mentality, we instead take that fierceness of the Mamba mentality and we live our lives not with the Mamba mentality, but with the kingdom mentality? We have to change our thinking uh, of not living with the mama mentality, but the kingdom mentality. The Bible says in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We have, we've got to get our eyes and our focus off of the stuff that is here today and gone tomorrow and put our focus on stuff of the kingdom we got to change our focus. It's all right to have drive. It's all right to have fierceness, to be the best at your job, to, to be the best at a sport, to be the best at whatever you do. And I think that, that we should do that. You know, God, God wants us to be the best at whatever we put our hand to, and we should, we should make sure that we're doing that. But in doing that, we can't put the kingdom of God on the back burner. It means that while we are being the best at whatever we put our hand to, we work even harder and even more fierce for the kingdom of God. And the only way to do that is to have kingdom mentality. And this morning, I'm going to share three principles of kingdom mentality that, we li- that, that if we live out, will change our lives. <clears throat> the first principle in having kingdom mentality is that we need to live selfless. We need to live selfless. Living selfless is really hard to do in today's culture. What do I mean by that? Well, let's just use social media for, for a minute. If you have any form of social media right now, how many of you have social media right now? Any form, Instagram, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, whatever you got. We all kind of have that. We all know what it's full of, and it's full of pictures of us. It's full of pictures of our life. Let's just use, I was gonna, I was gonna pick somebody in the congregation to use their Instagram, but I decided I'd be nice. We'll just use mine. I'll pick on myself a little bit, okay? And I have a couple pictures from my Instagram account. We'll go ahead and show them. Uh, this is uh, my family at Christmas time. Uh, 
Yep, there's me trying to ride a one wheel. I got far that day, but then I fell off. Um, <laughs> there's me and Maddie. Uh, that's my daughter. We, after um, running a couple miles, we were still happy, so that's good. Um, there's a, a movie night that we had at the house. The dog even jumped in on that one. We had some Cokes and watched a movie. It was, it was fun. But everybody, your Instagram is full of stuff about you. It's, it, there, there's a common thread that runs through today's culture, and that is I. I, I, I. It's all about me. And if we go through anybody's social media, you will find the common thread. It, it is all about me or yourself and what I'm doing, and all the great stuff that I have, or how great and awesome my kids are. Social media has turned our culture into a very selfish culture. It's all about me. And this isn't just with young kids, it's with all of us. We all, had, we all put our hands up when we asked about who had social media. But Jesus and the Word says we need to live counterculture. All right? Um, we, we need to live different than what the culture is saying. That means with culture saying how everything needs to be about us and about me, culture also says everything should be about how can I get ahead, how can I become famous, how can I become known. Jesus would actually say everything is about his kingdom, and it's time we get our eyes off of ourselves and put our eyes on him. Matthew 6, 24 in the Amplified Bible says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple... He must deny himself, set aside, set aside selfish interests, and take up his cross, express, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, and follow me. Believe in me, com- conforming to my example in living, and if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. It's time that we get that fierce kingdom mentality that says, I don't want to live selfish, but I want to live selfless. I want to deny myself, my needs, my wants, in order that the the name of Jesus gets spread further than ever before. Even if that means that I might suffer a little bit. Even if that means my name might not get known as much as I want it to be known. As long as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, his name is getting to be known, I'm all right with taking a back seat of that. We have to make sure that our ourselves takes a back seat to the kingdom of God and to Jesus, not vice versa. And most of the time we live the, the, that way of, Jesus, you need to sit over here so I can make sure my name is known, so I can make sure that everybody knows how great of a parent, how great my kids are, how great, you know, whatever that we put up in front of Jesus. We can't have that. We can say, Jesus, you first, me second. That is part of having the, the kingdom mentality is that we're going to live selfless. We're going to live selfless. The second principle in having Uh, the kingdom mentality, is we will need to live unoffended. This might be hard for some of us, all right? This is another area where we need to live counterculture lifestyle. We live in a time and a place where culture is to get offended about anything and everything. If you can name it, get offended about it. That's what culture says. Here's a video to help explain this a little bit results since I learned how to get offended. Now when people don't see things the way that I see them, I just get offended. And it teaches them how not to see things from their point of view. I'm offended that you would think you have the right to post that to your Facebook account. People have every right to see things from their perspective. As long as their perspective is the same as my perspective. Here's a water for you. I don't drink out of plastic. Why would you not know that? People who don't get offended are insecure, take no self-responsibility, and have no sense of purpose in life. I pray for them. JP, I don't even know why you're offended. I'm offended that you don't know how you offended me. JP, I wanted to uh, thank you and show my gift of appreciation by giving you my book, because I know you, you need it, right? You're just assuming that I know how to read? There's three easy steps to getting offended by anything. Step one, listen to what someone says, and then selflessly make it all about you by taking it personally, even if it has nothing to do with you. I really want you to have a great life. You're assuming my life isn't good enough the way it is? How dare you? Step two, you want to create a large amount of 
tension inside your body. You really want to concentrate on bringing the tension to your stomach, your chest, and your face. How are you doing today, JP? I'm offended that you would have to ask. Step three, now project outrage onto the other person. This will make it seem like you're getting rid of the tension inside your body, but it actually drives it down deeper inside you. And because it stays there, it'll make it even easier for you to get offended next time. I'm offended that you would wear that shirt. I'm actually a little offended by that. I'm offended that you're offended by that. Since I've learned how to get offended, I bring huge amounts of joy to everyone in my life. People feel like they're free to just be themselves when they're around me. I'm just happy I can make such a big difference in the world. <laughs> I've been having life changing. Of course, that's a little over the top, but it's not. <laughs> that's kind of the world that we live in. We get offended about everything. I also found a couple um, uh, dumb things that people got offended for um, online, and um, I'll read a couple of those to you. Uh, it says, there's, these are true stories, uh, but it says, one time a stranger got offended because another guy covered his ears when emergency vehicles went by. He was offended because he thought uh, that, that he was being, disres being disrespectful to the, the emergency vehicles. Somebody else got offended at a restaurant because the, their Swiss cheese didn't have enough holes in it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, there was a, a lady uh, who was a complete stranger got offended by another lady because she wouldn't let her, her hold her newborn baby. I mean, there, there's people in here that probably know me and wouldn't let me hold their newborn baby. I understand. <laughs> I understand, but you can't get offended about that. A guy got offended at a restaurant because he found a leaf in his soup. He swore up and down that they went out and they picked a leaf from a tree and put it in his soup. They, he was so offended by it that they had to have the manager come out and explain to the guy that it was a bay leaf and it was there for flavor. It wasn't there to do anything else. Like, now, these, these are funny examples. That was a funny video. But if we look into our own hearts... This is where we have to look into our own hearts. Would we find any offense or any unforgiveness in our own life? And, and maybe it's over something silly. Maybe it's something over something uh, big. But do you have that in your heart? This is the culture that we live in. But it's up to us to change that culture. And the only way to change that culture is to live counterculture. We got to be different. We have to be set apart. And how we fight offense is to live unoffended and with forgiveness. We have to have this kingdom mentality that we will not hold offense to others. And the author of Ephesians lays out the kingdom mentality that is totally counterculture to how the world lives these days. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and helpful to one another, tenderhearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. So if you want to have the kingdom mentality and to live unoffended, then you have to do what the scripture says. And we need to focus more on forgiveness rather than holding on to offense. Now this is a, a hard one for a lot of us because it's hard to forgive one another. But if we want to live with a kingdom mentality and we want to live unoffended, then we have to be willing to forgive one another. John Bevere says in the book, uh, Beta Satan, the man or woman who doesn't forgive has forgotten the price Christ paid for them on the cross. That's heavy. That's some heavy stuff right there. Biblical, biblical forgiveness does not mean we have to approve of what the other person did. We don't, have to, we don't even have to enter back into a relationship or a friendship with that person. But it does mean that we have to surrender those feelings to God and allow him to handle the situation. God calls us to, to this kingdom mentality and forgiveness. Matthew 5, 43 through 45a, uh, Jesus says these words. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. That's true counterculture right there. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of, the, of your Father in heaven. The Lord is calling us to love and bless our enemies and forgive them. He's not calling us to walk in offense or unforgiveness uh, in our hearts. If we choose to hold on to that offense, we choose not to forgive one another, that's when we start to live in a very dangerous, dangerous place. Because in Matthew 6, 15, it says, but if you refuse to forgive uh, others, your father will not forgive your sins. We don't have time to live in offense and not forgive others. Time seems like it's going uh, by so fast. 
And we shouldn't want to waste any of that time with not forgiving one another, with holding a grudge, with holding bitterness, with holding all that stuff. Because unforgiveness in your heart doesn't hurt anybody but you. Pastor Barry has said many times, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting other per- the other person to die. But really, it only hurts you because just like the scripture says, if you refuse to forgive others, your father, will not, your father in heaven will not forgive your sins. If we want to have the kingdom mentality and truly live counterculture, then we need to make sure we live unoffended and we get rid of any unforgiveness in our hearts. If we want to live this kingdom mentality and not be offended, then our prayer should be what it says in Psalms 139, 23. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. We should be all right with God searching our hearts, searching and cleaning us up from the inside out, getting rid of any unforgiveness, getting rid of any offense that we might have one to another. Let's clean up so that we can focus on the things that God has called us to do. This brings me to principle number three. If we want to have kingdom, the kingdom mentality, then we need to live eternity-minded. We need to live eternity-minded. A lot of the time, we can't have kingdom mentality because our attention and our focus are, on, are not set on the right thing. We prioritize the things of this world over the things that Jesus has called us to do. Our mind is so full of this stuff that one day will not make a difference in the grand scope of eternity. We are so busy thinking about and worrying about what others might think of us or, or we are letting how much money we make or we don't make consume our minds and consume our thoughts. We are just so focused on things of this world that we can't have kingdom mentality. That fierceness to get close to God and see others get close to God, we can't have with the, all this stuff in our minds. We end up falling into, a wor- into this worry mentality or like we discussed earlier, a selfish mentality. But if we can focus our minds on eternity and even ask the question in the grand scope of eternity, what does this matter? In the grand scope of eternity, the stuff that you're doing, does it matter? We have to put that into perspective. We'll be able to have that kingdom mentality that says things of this world will not run my life. We all have a mission. We're all called to do this mission and we all need to be focused on that mission. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. <clears throat> Where's your treasure at? Where is your treasure at? Because wherever your treasure, treasures are, that is where your heart and your focus are as well. It's time that we put our focus on heaven, which is our mission, and our thoughts go there before they go onto the stuff that, that this world has to offer. A good example that, that I can think of to help with this point is uh, one of my Walmart trips, one of my late night Walmart trips. Um, I remember on this particular trip, um, <clears throat> I, I was at my house and I put on a hoodie and I put my hood up. I wasn't in a bad mood. I wasn't in a bad mood. I just didn't want to see anybody or talk to anybody. All right. Um, by the way, that's not very eternity minded. All right. <laughs> I'll point that out right now. I know that this this trip wasn't very it, it started off not very eternity minded. But I put my hood up and I was like, I just want to get in. I want to get out. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. Let's just see how fast I can do it. Uh, it I know that's wrong, okay? Uh, but anyways, I was walking through Walmart, and of course, the thing that I needed well, it wasn't up front. It wasn't at a register. It was all the way in the back, and I had to go through all of Walmart to, to get it. And I'm heading over there. I'm heading to the back. I get all the way to the back. I get what I need. <clears throat> I make the turn. I have my hood up. I'm heading down the chip aisle, and I'm about all the way through the chip aisle, and I hear, Donnie, Donnie. And I, I'm like, how who knows me? Like, I have my hood up. I'm just running through. And I turn around. And and actually, before I turned around, I had a couple thoughts run through my head. I'll just be honest with you. The thoughts were, maybe if I walk a little faster, uh, it might look like I didn't hear her. Uh, I could just keep going. It's all right, you know. (laughs) The Lord will forgive me. Whatever, you know. I just didn't want to talk. But I stopped. I stopped. And I turned around. And uh, this, this lady was was standing there and she comes up to me and she's like, you're, you're the uh, pastor at, you're one of the pastors at First Assembly, right? And I'm like, yeah. 
I, I am. And she's like, I have, I'm, go- I'm, I'm having some issues in my life. And she kind of sat there and explained to me what was going on. And um, again, I, I had those thoughts, but my attitude started to change as I was sitting there listening, standing there listening to her. And she was telling me all the stuff that was going on in her life. And then she's like, can you, can you pray for me? And I was like, yes, I can. I, I changed my attitude. I was like, I have to, you know, be present, be here, help this lady out. And, and I, I prayed for her and um, right there in the chip aisle. And I, I moved on uh, f- from there. And, you know, at, from the chip aisle to the front, um, I saw her, her attitude change and she was real jittery and stuff like that and what, whatever was happening in her life. And I feel like the Lord really calmed her down at that moment. Now, I tell you that story because I shouldn't go into Walmart with the attitude of, I hope nobody sees me, or I hope I don't have to talk to anybody. I hope I don't have to pray with anybody. I hope I don't have to do whatever you feel in the break. I shouldn't go into, uh, I shouldn't go out like that. We should go everywhere with the attitude of, how can I be eternity-minded and affect the kingdom of God today? How can I? We should be excited to hopefully run into somebody that needs prayer. We should, be, we should be excited to hopefully run into somebody that needs an encouraging word or that needs a hug or that needs, you know, just a minute of your time. You know, uh, we should, that, that is the kingdom mentality that we need to have. That is having the kingdom mentality, and we are all called to have this mentality. Because honestly, our treasure is not here on this earth. Our treasure is in heaven, and we should want to see as many people as possible come to find that out in their own lives. And we need to go after that treasure with a fierceness, with a tenacity that, that we are going to see as many people as possible go to heaven with us. We have to have that kingdom mentality. One of my favorite scriptures is found in Philippians three thirteen and 14. It says, Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to, the, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. None of us have arrived yet. We still have work to do. One reason I like this scripture is because of the author uh, of Philippians. Uh, this is uh, Paul talking here, and he is saying things like, I've not taken hold of it. I need to forget what is, go- what is behind me. I, keep, I need to keep going forward. I have to press on toward the goal. This is a great man of God saying these things. He still needed to remind himself to keep going because there's a prize at the end. I need to stay eternity minded because there's a ton of stuff that can, di- can, that can distract us. If Paul is saying these things, how much more do we need to be saying these things? We need to have our minds on things of eternity. <clears throat> we need to have our, our mind on things of eternity more and less on the things that will one day be gone. We have to have the kingdom mentality all of the time, not just when we want to, but all the time we have to have this kingdom mentality. The cross in Jesus Christ is the best example of somebody who had the kingdom mentality. The act of going to the cross was, one, was, was the most selfless thing ever done. He died not because he wanted to, but he died on the cross because he knew that humanity needed it. Luke twenty two forty two says, Jesus says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Jesus is praying to his father and he's saying, take this from me. I, I, I don't necessarily want to do this, but if it's your will, I will do it. I will lay my uh, my needs, my wants, my desires down if it's your will. Jesus knew that he had to do that, that he had to lay that stuff down so that, so that he could die for humanity, die for us, die for uh, sinners like us. That's how selfless Jesus was when he went to the cross. Jesus uh, choosing to go to the cross is the kingdom mentality that, that I've been talking about today. Jesus lived with that fierceness for the kingdom, so much so that he was willing to die for it. This act of the cross was offensive, but Jesus chose to be unoffended through it all. He had people spitting on him, yelling at him, cursing him, all the way to his death. Even while on the cross, about to die, Jesus chooses to be unoffended and does one of the craziest things ever. He forgives them. He forgives them. 
Luke 23, 34, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus, while suffering, while hurting, while literally dying, decided to not take offense with them, and he said, Father, forgive them. Jesus chose forgiveness over offense. He chose to live unoffended. I look at that, and I'm like, how can we be so offended with people that might just disagree with us? How can we do that? Nobody has ever done anything as bad as those people did to Jesus, to any of us, and yet he forgave them. This example should challenge all of us to say, Father, forgive them to whatever, to whoever has caused us hurt that we might have in our heart. We can't live with that. It's not worth it. And look at Jesus, because while on the cross dying, uh, Jesus still was eternity-minded. Even while going through all the pain, he was still eternity-minded. Instead of focusing on all the pain that that he was experiencing, and instead of focusing on being mad and offended at everybody, Jesus was still focused on people and eternity. Luke 23, 43 says, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was saying that to one of the the, the criminals that was hanging right beside him on the cross. There were two criminals there. One was yelling and hurling insults at him, while the other criminal says, remember me when you get into your kingdom. And with all the pain and all the hurt and hanging there and dying, Jesus says, you'll be with me in paradise. His mind was still on eternity. He was so focused on the kingdom. Jesus always had the kingdom mentality. Wherever he went, Whatever he did, he was focused on the kingdom. Even while going through excruciating pain of being beaten, cursed, people turning their backs on him, Jesus still chose to live selfless, unoffended, and eternity-minded. That's the fierceness that we need to live with. That's the kingdom mentality that we as Christ followers need to walk around with all of the time. We don't have time to live selfish lives that are offended over every little thing that holds unforgiveness in our hearts over what people have done to us or we think they have done to us. Because if we live like that, we won't, we won't be eternity minded and people might miss out on the greatest thing ever. It's Jesus Christ and heaven. We don't have time for that. We don't want to miss that. We don't want to, to uh, not help somebody because we're offended. Because we just, we, we, we just we're, we're, we're so busy on our own schedule and we're so busy with what we have to go that, that we don't have time to talk to somebody at Walmart. You know, I have to check, check my heart all the time on that. We don't have time for that, man. Heaven is coming and we need to see as many people go there as possible. We need to make sure we make it. <laughs> You know, and, and, and we can't live offended with unforgiveness in our hearts and self, selfishly looking at ourselves. We got to remember there is a greater prize, and that prize is heaven. I remember hearing a story, uh, uh, one last story about Kobe Bryant and the day, um, the day that the Mamba mentality took over. It was during a game against the Orlando Magic, and at the time, Kobe was going through some personal stuff, and he just wasn't playing like himself. There's players that were on the Orlando Magic that was really close to Kobe Bryant, and they were like, we didn't even know who this guy was out on the court. And he's out there playing. And in fact, he was playing so bad that uh, through the first half of the game, he only had one point. He didn't have any more. He had one point. He went back into the locker room, and he knew something had to change. He knew that he couldn't play that way and expect the team to win. And some say that this was the day that the Mamba was born because he came out of that locker room and he came out in the second half and he put on a show. He ended up scoring 38 points that game. Remember, the first half, he only had one. He ended up scoring 38 uh, throughout the whole game, scored 24 points in just the fourth quarter alone, and the Lakers ended up winning that game. He ended up coming out in the second half playing with a fierceness and a confidence that nobody could stop him. And he was going to be the best no matter what. No matter what was going on, no matter anything that was happening, he was going to be the best. I tell you that today because we all need to walk out of here with a different mentality. 
We all need to leave this place with a different mentality. Maybe you've come in here and so far in life you have been living for yourself. You've had a, a selfish mindset. Or maybe you are carrying offense and unforgiveness in your heart and it's eating you up inside. Or maybe you are just living your life with a mindset of storing up treasures here on earth and eternity ha has not been your focus. It's been on the back burner. I want to encourage you guys today. Here's your second half. Here's your second half. When you leave here today, it's your second half. How are you going to walk out of this place today? Are you going to walk out and do the same exact thing that you've been doing and living your life the exact same way with a worldly mentality? It's not worth it. We don't have time for that. Or are you going to walk out of here with a kingdom mentality and a fierceness for the things of God. <clears throat> you have to decide that. Nobody can decide that for you. Nobody can say, okay, you got kingdom mentality, now go. You know, that, that has to be a choice that you make. So before you leave here today, I'm not going to have an altar call. There will be um, uh, prayer teams on either side of the, the platform today. You guys can go and get prayer. But I'm not going to have a particular altar call. I just want you guys, before you leave, to make up in your mind, to make up in your heart that your second half is going to be better than your first half. That your second half isn't going to be worldly-minded, but it's going to be kingdom-minded. That your, your second half is not going to be a half that, that lives in offense and unforgiveness and selfishness and, and a, a mindset that's always about me, me, me. But your second half is going to be a half that is going to see your friends, your family, your loved ones, people at Walmart, people on the street, people at your school. It doesn't matter where you go. Come to know Jesus. We have got to live with this fierceness. Life is so much bigger than basketball. <laughs> Life is so much bigger than maybe what your little world consists of. There is an eternity out there. And we have to live with this fierceness to see as many people as we can to come and know Jesus. Live with a kingdom mentality. Whenever you feel like you're slipping back into what you were in your first half, Remember that you, are king, you, you need to have this kingdom mentality. <clears throat> and so I'm going to pray. And then I just want you guys, before you leave, before you start your second half, if you have any offense in your heart, if you have any unforgiveness in your heart, get rid of it. Because the only person that's hurting is you. It's not hurting that other person that you have unforgiveness with. I guarantee it. If you've been living your life selfishly, it's all about you and all about what, what you're going through. You know, change that with the Lord. Say, God, I want to start living selfless. I want to start living selfless. Show me. Show me how can I do this. And where, where's your treasure at? Where is your treasure at? If it's built up here on earth, it's time to, to, to change that. It's time to toss that aside and say, you know what? My treasure, my thoughts, my heart, my everything is pointed to heaven. That's where it's going to lie. But you have to make that decision. So before you walk out, make those decisions. And, and how are you going to live your second half? We all have it. We have it. So let's live it with a kingdom mentality. Let's pray. Lord, we come, God, and we just thank you for this message, God. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you're doing in this place, God. And we, we thank you for everything you're doing in our lives, God. And I just pray, Lord, today that we leave this place different. We leave this place with a different mindset. We leave this place with a different mentality, God. And it's a mentality uh, of our life, our focus on the kingdom, God. Not on ourselves, not on what this world can offer, but what you can offer, God. And help us to walk out of here with a fierceness and a boldness and a confidence to, to spread your word. Lord, I just thank you for this day. And I thank you for everything that's going to happen uh, throughout the rest of this day. I thank you for what's going to happen at life groups, God, as life groups are starting. And I just know that you are going to start cleaning us up and changing us from the inside out, God. And if there's anybody in here with unforgiveness in their heart, Lord, or offense in their heart, I just ask that you would just bring that, 
uh, to the top and, and help them get that out of their life, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go have a good second half. Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First Assembly of God podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest message.